Hi, this is Harold Long. Welcome to the Hill Tran United Weekly Message and Podcast. I'm glad you're making time for this week's teaching. I will have more to say at the end, but for now, let's dive right in. I've been taught the same Bible story time and time again. I've heard it from teachers and preachers more times than I can count. I've seen it on felt boards, on television, even on the big screen. It's not just a story, it's THE story, according to Christians. It's the Easter story, and it's what I believe. I capitalize the word Easter because it's holy, it's set apart, it's reverent. And the center of the Easter message is this. Jesus died, but he didn't stay dead. And that, we're told, proves that Jesus is God. On the one hand, the claim is simple. He rose from the dead. On the other hand, the claim is insane. Most of the time, I believe the former. I believe in the simplicity of the Easter story. That Jesus died and rose again, and that's it. Done. No more questions. But some of the time, a minority of the time, I confess that I wonder if it really happened at all. The rising from the dead part. Now let me warn you, these are thoughts I've learned not to let out, especially with friends who go to church. But they're more than thoughts. They're honest questions. I mean, anyone can invent a religion, right? And maybe I've just bought into a man-made, man-invented religion. Maybe my upbringing has invented God for me. Raised that way, never really having the courage to step outside of my faith and take an honest look in. I've warned you already, but I want to say it again. I am a Christian, but I'm a Christian with doubts that creep in every now and then. And sometimes, I just need to voice my doubts without worrying about what other people think. Maybe my unchurched friends are right. Maybe everyone goes to heaven, and Jesus was simply a great guy with a stolen dead body. I feel like an idiot even suggesting this, but I, we, live 2,000 years after the fact. How much of the story could have been altered during that time? So, I'm admitting it. Most of the time, I'm fine with the resurrection story. But some of the time, I stop editing myself, and I honestly question everything. And I might be alone with these doubts, but I have a feeling that I'm not. Good morning! (laughs) Woo! Now we're rolling. It's good to see everybody. Welcome to those who are on Zoom, the Pod Rishners. Uh, for our first Zoom event here live at uh, TUMC. So we're glad you're with us if you're with us on Zoom. Uh, the technology will get better. We have some, some new equipment coming that's going to make it even a better experience. But until we get it, we are going to work with this based on the rise in COVID-19. COVID we wanted to offer a hybrid service um, to, you know, because of you know, the, the rate that it's going on at this point in time. But I want to welcome everybody. We're glad you're here. I want to thank everybody first off. For anybody who sent me a card or called me about a prayer or sent me a text or dropped food off at the house, we had a few people do that. Um, All that stuff was needed and appreciated. I've been living off chicken noodle soup somebody bought me for about three days now. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, My shoulder is doing well. I'm off all the pain medication already. All I'm doing is, uh, you know, ibuprofen and Tylenol. I had the best nurse on the planet, Nurse Susie. Yeah, you know, the bride, and 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 and, uh, and then I, I have to mention Emily. She's been awesome as well, especially helping me prepare for this week. So thank you to those two, and thank you for everybody. I want to thank Pastor T. Thursa uh, for sp- sitting in last week. I'm sure she did awesome. Uh, I didn't have anybody send me any hate mail or anything, so I'm sorry it was a uh, it was great. So I appreciate her. I appreciate her church and her ministry and everything that they do, and uh, and I'm sure it was a great time. Um, this morning we're going to conclude our fall message called Finding God in Popular Culture. And on November 15th, when I was here the last time, you know, we, our name of our, the title of our message is What is Truth? And so I challenged you pretty hard in there, during that message. And today's message is titled Certainty, an Enormous Price to Pay. And I told you we would bring this whole message to a conclusion 
today when we came back. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to bring, we're going to bring this wrap, this, this several weeks that we spent this fall going through this message series. And what I want to lift up this morning is when we, you know, you guys voted on this series. I gave you a lot of op- options and even the options to fill in the blank as far as what you'd like to, to, to study. And that was at both churches. And it was overwhelmingly this topic of finding God in popular culture. And so with that topic, you know, you sit and reflect and you pray and, and where am I supposed to go with this message? I mean, how do we make this into a message series and what do we do with it? And so I really just wanted to look at the culture and the shift that happened in culture since 1950, you know, you know right after World War II and the shift that happened in our culture and, and the things that we have and that we experience today in what I call the world system. And so we, you know, we did that. So we looked at every decade. We looked at the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s. And today we'll look briefly at the 2010s. But, but with that, we just slowly showed you how the world has changed and how that's changed in popular culture and music and TV and video that you watch. You know, and, and things that you watch today, no way you would see those things in the 50s, 60s, 70s, or probably even the 80s. Today, there's nothing that comes out on TV that surprises me. There's nothing that comes out in books or movies. Uh, it's everywhere. It's pretty much go as you come, free as you go uh, when it comes to culture and worldviews and, and relativism is, is in a big way. We listed up several words. The very first message we had here, and I gave, you, I, didn't, I gave you definitions for those words, words like postmodernism, relativism, individualism, consumerism, capitalism, uh, democracy, socialism, on down the line, all these words that are prevalent in our world system today. And we looked at those in a big way and how they have shaped our culture and how they press against our, our own beliefs, our own embedded theology, if you would have it, that all of us struggle with from time to time. And it all creates within us an element of doubt from time to time, just like the message that we read in Scripture and also the bumper video that you saw this morning. But today, we're going to focus on uh, this, this subject of truth, and I'm going to address and bring a conclusion that what is truth? Our Scripture reading from the Gospel this morning centered on doubting Thomas. And the subject of doubt, it's a fair subject, and it's a subject that's talk too little about in Christian circles, really in faith circles. But I would suggest to everybody here this morning and those listening online that you're more like Doubting Thomas than you are anything. And and there's a lot more Doubting Thomases in the world than there ever was just pure out, sold out, all in, all the way down, all the way in Christians in the world today, that we all have our struggles with doubt in our scripture, but along with, as, as well as our sermon bumper video, what that gentleman laid out and is thinking, he's, he's talking out loud in the video, and he's talking about his struggles, that he's challenged with the resurrection story and with his Christian faith, and that he concludes with by saying that, you know, I, I'm probably not alone with my doubts. I'm, prob- I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that, that experience life the same way I do, have the same kind of doubts. And so I would say that's true, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. You know, over the last 70 years, and I've only been alive for most of those, we've watched a more... I would call it a liberal approach to discussing and analyzing very divisive subjects that America seemed pretty firm on or pretty certain on for a long, long time. And some of you that are older than me will know what I'm talking about, that these, these certain precedent, the certain culture, the certain worldview have been the mainstay in, 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 our, in America for many, many, many years. But subjects such as politics and sexuality, abortion, gender, social justice, systemic racism, war, climate, change, creation, evolution, religion, spirituality, medicine, and this subject of truth or absolute truth. These are all subjects that have been brought into the world, brought out of their hiding places, if you want to call it that, or, or, their, or the box of certainty, and they've been brought out into the light and, uh, and, and subject to a lot of criticism, a lot of debate, a lot of interpretation. And with that, we find the culture that we have today. And for some of us, you might struggle with that. And no question about it. But we are not going to address each of those subjects. I just lifted up by no means. But we will discuss the subjects of truth and faith for a little bit today as we bring this message to a finality because I think it's really, really important. Um, the 2010s uh, weren't, were not different than any of the other decades that I lifted up as it relates to finding God in popular culture. We've been able to easily go through the 50s all the way to the 2010s and pull out music, pull out TV shows, pull out movies, 
and show you how God has influenced popular culture, how different movies and, and very popular movies and very popular songs that would fall into the secular categories uh, for the most part were influenced by, by God, by spirituality, by Christ, by Christianity. Uh, and it's easy to do. In the 2010s, it's very easy to do. Then these are some of the big Christian movies, if you want to call it a 2010, The Case for Christ, a great, great book uh, that was written, uh, but a movie that went along with it, the movie Risen. I can only imagine the story of the lead singer from Mercy Me, uh, a very popular song we sing it here once in a while. I can only imagine um, one of my favorite bands, Susie and I just saw them last year. We sat front row and watched Mercy Me in, in Springfield. It was incredible, along with Crowder. We loved it. We had a blast. Um, the, the, the movie The Black Panther, uh, a, a movie that came out that has a huge spiritual overtone. And if you haven't watched any kind of movies or anything with spiritual glasses on, I encourage you, hopefully, if, if this message series has done anything else for your life, it's challenged you as you sit down and read a book or you sit down and watch a TV show, or you sit down and watch a movie that you put on the spiritual frames, and you start to look for God in popular culture. You start to look for God's influence, His fingerprints, and these things that you're absorbing. And it will, it will bring on a whole new flavor for you when you watch TV. It truly, truly will, or you read. And the same thing with the movie Black Panther. You can just watch it from a, a fan, a Marvel fan, a DC fan point of view, you know, somebody that's into comics. But if you sit down and watch it with glasses, spiritual glasses, the movie will come alive in a whole different way for you. So I encourage you to start doing that with, when you go into popular culture and, and uh, put on your spiritual lenses. A uh, movie called Breakthrough, Ragamuffin, The War Room. These are movies you may have watched in your house. Harriet, movie that Susie and I watched. Uh, Hacksaw Ridge, Les Mibrales, or Mi Les Miserable, or however you want to pronounce it. Les, Les Miserables, or whatever you want to, the little wee, 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 wee on it. Uh, but that had a very spiritual message in it if you followed it and you really understood it for what it was. Uh, TV shows, The Hand of God, God, Friend, and Me, Marvel, Waiting for God, American Gods, A Man Called God, God and More. These are all popular shows in the 2010s. And music about God, good country song called My Church by Mary Morris, uh, very popular song not too many years ago, um, has a spiritual overtone. Song, song called Brother by Need to Breathe featuring Gavin DeGraw. Uh, Beer with Jesus by Thomas Rhett. Jesus to a Child by the late George Michael. Pray for Peace, Reba McIntyre. God Gave Me You, which is a great song by Blake Shelton. Uh, by the Grace of God, Katy Perry. The Preacher and Stranger, Joey and Rory. All in, All in It by Justin Bieber. Unspoken by The Cure. And Hello World by Lady Annabellum or Lady A, whatever you want to call them today. Those are just a few highlights of the 2010s where I can easily look into movies, TV, and music and see God's influence in life. Like all decades, you know, like I said before, it was easy to do that. But as we've seen the erosion of our culture, if you want to call it that, some people may be say, so to argue that we've been liberated as a culture. Some of you may say that we've been, our culture's been eroded and we're going into dangerous times. But when you look at our world as it is today, and you see the division that we have in our world, and you come from back from where we came from, and even people that are here before me, you know, when you look at what's going on, and you watch TV, and you read the papers, and you see everything, I, I, don't, I think it's hard not to be pretty sad and pretty scared about where culture is today on a, lot of, on a lot of spectrums. At least I am, if I'm transparent with you. I have total faith God's still on the throne, and, and God will prevail in the end. I don't know what that looks like or how it looks like. I have total faith in that. But it still doesn't mean from a human perspective that I don't get saddened when I see some of my closest friends who are, are torn apart on social media because of the things they've said to each other or, thing, or the way they believe uh, about politics or this or that. So it's a, it's, a tough, it's a tough time that we're in. But it was a tough time in the 50s. So I could pick any decade and easily say it was a tough time then. That's life. And you know, the, the next period that we go through is going to be tough too. Um, it's just called the human experience. But I ask you at the beginning of this message series, and then again as I close out the message two weeks ago, some really hard questions. Questions that you probably won't hear from a pulpit very often. You definitely won't hear it from pastors very often. Um, but you'll hear it from me, and you always will, uh, because I'm not afraid to tackle tough questions. I'm not afraid to talk about what's going on in the world and the tough subjects of the world. And, and, and what I'm going to talk about today is the subject of truth and faith. And, and how a lot of people are stuck in this box right here, this box of certainty. And, and it's cost you a lot. 
It truly, truly has, and I'm going to break that down for us. But I want to go back and reflect on some of these questions that we started this whole message series with. So with close to 5,000 religions in the world, that's what there is, close to 5,000 different religions. It's hard to believe there's that many in the world, but there's close to 5,000. Does that mean, as a believer, as a Christian, that 4,999 are wrong and Christianity is the only true religion? And so I challenge you on that. I ask you to raise your hands. I'm just asking you to ponder it because that's a reality. That's a fair question. Now, all these questions I'm asking you are fair questions. But these are in the mainstream of life. If you say yes, then how do you respond to the countless miracles, spiritual experiences that people who engage these other religions say they experience? How do you account for that? I mean, that's a, that's a fair question. And so you need to wrestle with that. If no, then does this mean that the billions of people that choose to embrace these other religions are separated from God somehow, the one true God, and literally will spend eternity in hell? Is that true? Knowing everything you know about the Bible, everything you know about Jesus Christ, His heart, His mind, His grace, His mercy, everything that He puts out there in the world, is that true? And that's something you as a believer got to wrestle with. And the reason I press you on it is because I promise you your kids are going to wrestle with it. And your grandkids are going to wrestle it. And as, we, as the generation becomes a lot more liberal, let's say, the questions are only going to get harder and deeper and tougher. And it's why a lot of people, especially college-age students, again, we've mentioned this before in this series, drop their faith by the time they go to college, as soon as they get there, because they're hit with this. I can remember my first class on evolution. I was brought up a Catholic kid. I had a Catholic worldview. I was before Vatican II. I had you know, a certain worldview about everything, especially the Bible, how old the world was, all these certainties. I was, I was stuck in this box, by, definitely stuck in this box of certainty. And when I had my first evolution class, my world got sh shattered. My faith got trashed. I tried to push back a little bit and got devoured like a cow, you know, in a butcher shop. I mean, the, the, the teacher easily butchered me because I had no way to articulate or even put my thoughts together. And so I walk out to feed and basically my faith went into the trash almost immediately. And I never came back to it you know, for a long, long time. I just went out to the world system and got caught in the dark, and the dark did everything but destroy me. That's what happened to my faith when I got pressed against some of these issues in my life because I was stuck here. And when somebody pressed me here on this box of certainty, it really rattled my world. So I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey, but these are fair questions. Here's some more. Is it possible? So this is the possibility. Is it possible that God, in some mysterious way, chooses to reveal God's nature and self in other forms outside the context of Christianity. Is it possible? That's something you've got to wrestle with because you've got 4,999 religions that say yes to that. So how do you explain that? If you say no, you know, then you're back into this box of certainty and you're at odds with billions of people in the world the minute you say no to that. You're here. You're back in this box. I'm certain I'm right. I'm certain the 4,999 are wrong. I don't know what you call their miracles or their experiences, but they're not of Christ. They're not of the God, the one true God. So therefore, you're here. And that's where you rest at. That's where I've been. I've been in this box. I, I could easily fit in this box. Believe it or not, I could fit in it. <laughs> and what about the 300 plus 12-step programs? I mean, there's Alcoholics Anonymous, which is the most popular. But out of that Alcoholics Anonymous movement back in the 30s, today there's over 300 12-step programs. We're millions, I mean millions of people have went to experience freedom from the oppression of whatever hurt, habit, or hang-up was crushing their life. And they lived into spiritual principles as a way of life. They adopted it, and they became happy, and they became joyous, and they became free. And they live in a world today where they're out there in the world, and they're usefully and happily whole. How do you explain that? I mean, there's, these are real questions that you need to wrestle with, if you're, especially if you're stuck here in this box of certainty. These are things that you need to wrestle with. Then there's a divisiveness between Christianity itself inside our Christian circles. You don't think there's divisiveness? There's probably 80 churches within a five-mile radius of here that all have different little quirks or little interpretations of this or that. We want Dr. Pepper with communion. No, we want Mountain Dew. And the list goes on. And then, then you've got all these different walls and different churches. I mean, in Jesus' context, there would only be one church. We would all be one body doing things together. So I guarantee you, if Jesus was here to scold us in person, we would be massively scolded, I can promise you, as a, as a Christian community for how we carry ourselves. But the divisiveness that exists between Christians, you have young earth cre uh, creationists who believe the world is 10,000 years old or less. 
And I'm asking you to raise your hand. Maybe you fall into that camp. But how certain are you of that? And if you're certain of it, it you're, you're in this box. I'm just telling you, you're in this box. You have the evolution Christians, Christians who believe in creation, believe that God created everything, but more in line with the, the 4.85 billion years of age as the planet Earth. That's a big discrepancy, 10,000 years, 4.85 billion years. So how do you wrestle with that as a Christian believer? And does that create any doubts for you, if, especially if you're stuck as a young earth creationist? And science and science keeps putting out facts and, and these things that says that no, the earth's really, really old. So how do you deal with that? And so Christians get their faith really rocked and challenged by these really tough questions. And lastly, the Bible itself, the 66 books of Scripture, are they to be taken literally and as a genuine account, exactly how it happened? It's not just allegory. It's not just a theory. It's not just uh, an articulation of how God is and his character is, but it's actually how it happened from the beginning to end. Is that, do you hold on to that? And if it is, then you're, you're again, you're right here in this box, a box of certainty. And, uh, and, the, and you're, or you had the Bible in this box. So you had this Bible in the box of certainty. So you're, you take the Bible literally for everything it says to be literal, a, a true historical account, exactly how it happened, no deviation from it. Uh, there's no allegory stories. There's no metaphoric piece to it. It's actually truth. That's what, exactly what happened. Do you, do you believe that or do you not? And so these are things that this is real life stuff. You don't hear about it in Bible studies and you don't talk about it from here uh, most of the time because you don't want to raise, uh, you know, raise people's uh, worries or you know, bring their doubts to life. I want to bring your doubts to life. I want you to be able to ask questions. I want you to be able to bring any doubts that you have out of their hiding places and just wrestle with them. It's fine. That's the beautiful part about it. It's okay. Look at Doubting Thomas. He didn't believe even though his buddies he'd been running with for three plus years who walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, ate with Jesus, seen Jesus, all these things. And then they said, you know what, man, you just missed out. The Lord was just here. Well, I don't believe it. I'm not buying it. I love you guys, but I'm not buying it. I got to see the Lord. I got to see the scars in his hand. I got to touch the wound in his side or I'm not buying it. And friends, I'm telling you, if I missed last Sunday, if Jesus showed up here and my sister Pam and Monica, my brother Dale, and, and sister Bert, and Ron, and Rich, and going down the line. All of you said, hey, you missed it, man. I mean, you picked a bad day to go deer hunting because the Lord was here last week. He was right here. And I would say, did you get any pictures? <laughs> did you get any selfies? Do you have any video? Because I want to see it, right? You know, I want to see it, too, because an element of doubt is going to come into play there. Um, and so that's just being real. And so I'm just asking you, friends, to be real with this, this challenge because it'll make a big difference in your faith journey. It'll make a big difference in your prayer life, how much time you spend in God's word, how you experience the world, how you experience the kingdom, your effectiveness in the kingdom, how you answer these questions will make a big difference. And so I encourage you to wrestle with these things as we go through this. If we're honest, we all have doubts. We have doubts about many questions I just posed to you, and that was just a handful. I could sit here all day and just make up questions that would press against your faith and challenge you in your intellect and in, in, in your upbringing and what's embedded inside you. But your kids have doubts, I can promise you. Your grandkids have doubts. Your friends have doubts. Your neighbors have doubts. And guess what? So did every one of the apostles had doubts, every one of them. And again, they walk with Jesus. They talk with Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They watched the miracles with their own eyes. And yet they still all had doubts. Mag Mary Magdalene had doubts. Jesus' own mother had doubts. Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, had doubts. All these people had doubts, and they were watching it happen. And then here you are, 2,000 years separated from those times. And, okay, you got doubts, so what? Embrace them. So does everybody else. Everybody else has had their doubts. So embrace the doubts, bring them out, talk about them from time to time, but don't let them consume you and don't let it contaminate your faith or ruin your faith. Because if you're stuck in certainty, if you're stuck in this box, then the pain of your doubts becomes so great that all you can do is live into this even more. And your world gets smaller and smaller and smaller. The people you hang with, the people you read about, the people what you watch on TV, everything gets pretty small. And you're not very effective in the kingdom when you're stuck in this box of certainty. And so just think about that and be challenged by that. But I want you to in a big way. If you have your lesson plans, I'd encourage you to pull them out now. 
We're going to go over full, four bullet points as we bring our message to a conclusion. And, and I hope that really wherever you're at on your spiritual journey, I hope nothing more than you get liberated today a little bit and, and realize how, what the cost of this is. And it's an enormous cost to be stuck here as a believer. It's an enormous cost to you uh, in a lot of ways, and we'll break that down. So we're going to look at uh, four points today. So this is bullet number one. God is the only thing that we put in the box of certainty. It's the only thing, friends, that we put in here. This is it, God. God is the only thing that we put in this box. Case in point, when you get on an airplane and fly from here to San Francisco, let's say, are you certain that that plane's not going to crash? No, you're not certain. But you have enough confidence in the pilot, the, the airline association, you know, and everybody else, every other organization that has any to do with flying, that you, that you have enough confidence that you can get on that plane and fly from point A to point B and not crash. And so that's why you get on it. Amen? If you get in the car and drive from here to Hillsboro, am I confident, am I, am I certain that I'm not going to have an accident or somebody's not going to swerve and hit me and seriously injure me or take my life? Am I certain of that? No, I'm not certain of that. But I have enough confidence that I get in the car and I drive. And I don't, that, I don't obsess about that as I'm driving, you know, in the world. When I married Susie and she said, I do, and I said, I do, I slipped her a few hundred dollars, she said, I do. <laughs> but, but when she said, I do, and I do, am I certain that Susie's going to stay with me the rest of my life? Am I no different than you are with your brides? Maybe the longer you're married, maybe so. But I'm just telling you, are you really certain? Because there are a lot of variables that could come into play to change that. But I'm confident enough that she's committed to that covenant. And, so, and I think she's you know, confident in me enough of that covenant that when we say I do, that we do. And that we're going to live out this matrimony together, we're gonna, this husband and wife deal. We're going to live it out, even though we do it imperfectly. And we have our struggles just like everybody else. But we're committed to that. That's a covenant. But am I uncertain of anything? No, I'm not certain of nothing. But I'm pretty confident that if we keep God at the center of our marriage, that we're going to have a pretty good life and life's going to turn okay. But I'm not certain about anything. But I can promise you that certainty is where God fit in the box for me for a long time. I was certain that the earth was this, this age. I was certain of this, and I was certain of that. And, uh, and I was certain, and I listened to preachers, and I read books, and I do all that stuff that just fed this certainty, certainty, certainty. And if you didn't fit, and your language didn't fit, or your belief didn't fit, then I just gave you the Heisman. I didn't give you the time of day. I discounted you. We didn't have any conversation. And that caused a lot of friction in my life, especially as a young believer. Because, you know, people don't even have a conversation with you because they struggle with that. But I'm just telling you, yet most Christians, you may not be sitting here today with your box, God and certainty, but I promise you there was probably a time you did. And it costs you a lot. It's an enormous cost to pay when you do that. Slide number two. It's normal to have doubts, especially in the culture we live in today. And like I said, because of the liberalism that's taking place in culture, things like sexuality, gender, racism, politics, truth, faith, spirituality, are heavily debated in many, many circles today with many different worldviews on those things at more of a public level and on media than ever before in the movies and popular culture going down the line. So with all that being said, it's easy to have your faith challenged. It's easy to somebody throw a dart and you duck. Uh, and, and, and be challenged for a little bit in your, in your faith walk, especially when you see 4,999 other religions out there claiming to be truth, claiming to have an answer, claiming to be, not, not all of them claim to be the only way, but many do. This is it. There's only one God, and we believe it, and we study it, and we live it, and we walk it, and we talk it, and we do it the right way, and you don't. So whatever you got's not authentic, it's discounted, and you'll pay a heavy price when it comes to the eternity. There's that kind of worldview out there in the world. Slide number three. Finding God in popular culture is easy, but so is finding different interpretations and experiences of God in popular culture. And so that's the truth. There's many people, I lifted up 4,999 of them, that think different than Christianity. I lifted up 300 plus 12-step groups that exist in the world. And if you're living in the box of certainty, then these different interpretations and experiences that you're running into in this postmodern world that we live in will cause you a tremendous amount of pain. And they will also cause you to 
have a lot of friction with people. And sometimes people in your own world, your spouse even, your own kids, your own grandkids, your neighbors, your siblings, parents, people that you love and adore. There's many, many relationships in these units that I just lifted up that are separated because of this. Because you don't believe the way I believe, you're really not welcome here. And we're not going to have a conversation. We're not going to break bed together. We're not, we're not going to do anything together because I'm only with people that are in this box. And there's a lot of families like that. There's a lot of heartbreaks like that. There's been a lot of bridges destroyed because of that, uh, because of this mindset. So what did Jesus push back against? What did Jesus push the Pharisees on? This. The Pharisees are so certain they were right about everything, about the law, about who God is and what God's about. And Jesus, if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, which I do, the full emulation of God in person, right here in front of you, the true character, every bit of him, pressed against this to the religious authority of the day. Who did Jesus hang around? Did Jesus hang around people that were in this box? I mean, come on. Think about all the stories you know about. Did Jesus hang with people that were in this box? No. He did not hang with people that were in that box. And how did Jesus meet people? He met people where they were at. And what did he do? He just loved them right where they were at. And yeah, he was able to speak truth into their life, but he didn't do it from this perspective. He did it from a real human perspective because he was as much human as you and I, but he was fully God too. That was the, the, the miracle of it. But what did Jesus do? Think about how Jesus lived his life. And that's how you're called to live in the world and not be stuck in this. You know, you shouldn't be at odds with other Christian brothers and sisters around us. It drives me nuts, especially in ministerial alliances when we try to get them together. And it's like when I go to Hillsboro and I say, what's the ministerial alliance around? There's 80 churches in five miles. Oh, there isn't one. It disbanded a long time ago. I mean, that's like, that's like an F on your report card. I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge failure in Christian circles, friends. It's, it's, it's embarrassing as a, as a kingdom person to walk in and, and realize there's nothing going on because we drank Dr. Pepper and you drank Mountain Dew. That's really what it comes down to. But it's the world that we live in. And shame on us as kingdom people. But it's because of this that we have 80 different churches in the world today. It's because I'm so certain that how I'm interpreting this particular passage in Scripture is right that this is how we're going to do it. And if you don't do it that way, then take your coffee pot and your resentments and go start another church. But that's what happens in the world today. And we're so broken as a society, not just as, as, as the humankind, as a race, but I'm talking about the entire culture. Even Christianity is so fractured. You know, you got Republican Christians and Democratic Christians, and I'm telling you, Jesus wouldn't have anything to do with any of it. You know, you could never, you can't open the Word of God and show me that anywhere. You cannot do it. I'll challenge anybody any day of the week they want to do it. You cannot do it. And, uh, but yet there's many people, especially more popular preachers on TV, stouting this stuff. What did Jesus say the most important commandments were? Love God, love people. To love. That's how we're supposed to live in the kingdom life. I can't love people if I'm living here. Because unless you're here, you're not going to even be in my circle. I'm not even going to have anything to do with you. And if I do, my whole objective is to get you in my box. I love NASCAR. I go to NASCAR races. Susie's been to a few NASCAR races with me. And there's always that person. You can ask her. There's always that person on the bullhorn. They're sitting up there on the bullhorn. This is what they're saying. Hey, you need to repent. You're going to hell. Everybody here, everybody I can see, you're going to hell. You need a savior. You need to do it right now. You need to do it today. I mean, they're on the bullhorn screaming this stuff right in the middle, you know, as you're walking into the race. And you go up and pray for them and go, how's it working for you today? Yeah, yeah. How many prospects did you get? I mean, Jesus never taught that way, never preached that way, never walked that way. So why do we get caught in this thing? But we're caught there, friends, and, and so many of us. And, and so you're ineffective. You can't even really be effective in your whole thing. And we watched a little scene from Grey's Anatomy last week, a few weeks ago where, you know, a, a dad hadn't seen her daughter in four years, a bit because she was in the LBGTQ plus community, you know, that totally went against his box of certainty, and he was certain that she was frying in hell, and that's all he came to tell her, was to get her back in the box. That was, that was his goal, not to love her, not to see what she needed. His goal was to put her back in this box, 
And how did it end up? You saw the video clip. It ended up driving a bigger wedge between them than ever before. And her using scripture more articulate than he did in that particular scene to, to, to argue where Jesus comes from. And so there's a lot of families, siblings that are, that are disenfranchised from their family units because they've, they've chosen a certain path in their life or they chose not to believe. I'm, I'm going to just do Hinduism. I'm going to do Buddhism. I'm going to do yoga and, and, and Eastern meditation. I'm not going to church. I'm not doing all that stuff. And there's a lot of families saying, then you, you're not welcome here. They may not say those words, but that's pretty much how it is. You're not welcome here. And, 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 uh, and that's not kingdom living, and that's not Jesus living, friends. The last slide that we're going to look at. You're encouraged to approach your spiritual life with confidence and not be trapped by certainty. If you take nothing else out of this message today, I hope you take that with you. That you learn to walk in confidence in your faith. But don't allow the, the, the price of certainty to rob you from the relationships you have in your life, from the, from the things that God wants to do in your life. Because once you do, you, you've just cut yourself off from billions of people in the world, probably most people in the world, you've cut yourself off from them. But if you live a life of love and service, if you live a life fully committed to loving God and loving your neighbor, meeting them where they're at, loving them for who they are, walking and talking about truth and life in perspective with confidence that you believe what you believe, but in total confidence that you're not stuck in certainty. It will open doors for you and you'll open dialogues for you you never had before. And guess what? A lot of those people you will invite into the kingdom because they're going to say to you, I don't know what it is about you, man, but I love you. You're awesome. I enjoy hanging around you. I'm a better person because I'm around you. What is it you do? How do you pray? Tell me about this Jesus-looking guy. Can I come to your church sometime? But when I'm out there in that box of certainty going, you know what, I, I know you're in that Eastern meditation stuff, and I know you, you know, this and that, but, you know, you know all that's going to do is get you into eternity in hell. You're going you're to burn forever. You're going to fry. You're going to have the gnashing of teeth. That's what's going to happen to you. How effective is that? Especially in the culture we live in today. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, you might have won a lot of people to Christ with that message. But not today, because of postmodernism, because of relativism. And so I hope that you learn that just love people where they're at. Just love them. Be an authentic Christian. Be a true kingdom person. Love people for who they are. And you'll be amazed what God does with that. What did, Peter, what did Jesus tell his last words to Peter before he left this earth for good, before he ascended into heaven once and for all? What did he say? Peter, do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Now, he's aggravated because he's asking three times in front of everybody, but that's really getting back at him, I think, for that, denying him three times. He just, he's, <laughs> but he asked him three times. And ultimately, he says, love my sheep. What does Paul say? All this stuff you're doing, if you don't do any of it in love, it's worthless. You can preach all this certainty stuff you want, but if you're not doing it in love... It's, it's, it's nothing but a loud symbol. It's a loud clang. It doesn't mean anything. So as kingdom people, just learn to love people. And if they don't think like you, walk like you, talk like you, eat like you, act like you, so what? Just love them, because that's what Jesus would do. And you're going to have a lot more influence by loving people and walking shoulder to shoulder with them and having discussions about truth. I had the life I had today because... Of, of God, no question about it. When I was 21 years old and alcoholism had its teeth in me, it did everything but kill me. Alcoholism did everything but kill me. I spent my entire teenage life engaged in alcoholism and addiction, and it did everything but destroy my life. But at the age of 21, I said three words, God help me. I didn't say, Jesus, come be my Savior. I didn't say, Jesus, come be the Lord of my life. I wouldn't even mention the words of Jesus for years to come. I said, God, Help me. And from that moment till I stand here today, 33 plus years later, I've never picked up another drink of alcohol. My life has totally been transformed. It's totally been changed. So I have a confidence in this thing called God, this thing called a higher power, this thing called divine intelligence, intelligent agency, however you want to call it, however you want to frame it, the great creator, the I am. I have total faith in that because I had my own experience with that. It would be years, a few years later before I walk back to my Christian circles. And I walk with my bag of stuff. I walk with my box of doubts. I walk with my bag of questions. 
Because I had the doubts and I had the questions. And I walk into those places and I started to wrestle with this stuff. And I started to push back a little bit. Yeah, but what about this? And what about that? And I started to do my own research and do my own study and really study who Jesus was and really get into the Gospels and have my own Gospel experience. Read the book, the Bible, from the beginning in as a narrative. Not as a literal, literal historical book, but as a narrative. And guess what I've discovered? It's the Gospel of the Kingdom. It's a great love story. And the beautiful part about it is you and I are part of the story. If we choose to be. We're given free will to choose to be a part of the story or not. I've chosen to be a part of the story. And with it, my faith has changed. My life has progressed. I believe in the Gospels. I believe what the Gospels say are true for a lot of reasons. And I don't need to get on those today. But I have, am I certain of everything? No. But I have a whole lot of confidence, friends. I have a whole lot enough confidence that I've been walking this walk for 33 plus years. And I gave my life to it. I gave my life to walk this path to whatever God wants to do in my life. Am I certain of everything? No, and I don't need to be. I don't really care. What I know is that God is real, that God loves you, and he loves you, and he loves you, and he loves you, and he loves me. And that's what he asks us to do is love each other, walk with each other, encourage each other, feed those who are hungry, clothe those who are cold, you know, go out and provide justice, righteousness, and peace in the world. That's what I want you to do. I believe fully that God will come back. But Jesus himself said, nobody knows the day or the hour that I'm coming back. The Son of Man doesn't even know. So these prophets and all these people on AM radio, whatever, that are so certain that the stars lined up and the the things that are going on in the world are certainly, this has got to be it, it's nothing else but hogwash. Because when Jesus himself says, the Son of Man doesn't even know when I'm coming back. But when I come back, we will restore the kingdom of God here. Not somewhere else, not some planet out in the universe, but right here, right here, right now. This is where the kingdom of God will happen. But until then, you and me as kingdom people, our job is just to usher in the kingdom of God. That's it, to do the best we can with that. How do we do it? By loving people. By loving ourselves, by loving our family. By loving God, by worshiping God, by praising God like we do on Sunday mornings. But it's really the 166 more hours that we spend out there in the world. It's to be loving. It's to be Jesus with skin on. That's my duty. That's my job. And I will lead a lot more people to Christ with that attitude. So when I walk into a prison to do ministry, I don't walk in with my box of certainty. I walk in with a whole lot of confidence. And I can walk into a room that might be mostly Muslim. There might be a lot of atheists there. There may be a lot of agnostics there. There may be Hindus there. Go on down the line. There may be just people who don't know what's going on. There's people that call themselves spiritualists. I believe in God, but I don't believe in any particular religion. I'm not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person. I've heard it all. But welcome. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Come on in. Come on in. And then we're going to discuss things, and we're going to have real conversations. And I have confidence in what I believe, so I don't have to apologize for why I lean on prayer and meditation and do certain things and carry myself and read certain things to inspire my life and devote my life to. But at the same time, if you're sitting there disagreeing with me or you have a whole different interpretation, I can have enough humility to sit there and listen to you and respect you and let you talk. And if nothing else, what you're saying is only going to enhance what I believe that much more. You know, and it may even add to it. It may just help me even believe a little stronger. So it's a powerful, powerful way to live the kingdom life. And so I encourage you to live that way. Uh, I encourage you to know that's how Jesus lived. Study the Gospels, how Jesus lived his life. And he pressed against anybody who was stuck in that box of certainty. You can do your stories and read historical interpretations, all this stuff, nothing wrong with that. But when I take it and I put it in the box of certainty, it's where it becomes a real handicap for me in the kingdom. So I am just encourage you to be open-minded, to be willing and be honest with yourself, that you do have doubts. I have doubts from time to time as well. But the doubts are fewer and far between today than they've ever been. And because I have a faith that's built on confidence, not certainty, I can go to interfaith functions. I can go serve the homeless. I can go work in prisons. I can go work in food pantries. I can visit people in other countries on mission trips. I can walk shoulder to shoulder with people that I'm as far apart as you could ever be and do so gladly and proudly and fully accepting them for who they are that day. And then, and like I said, and through that conversation, through that transformation, there's going to be a lot of opportunity to lead a people to Christ, you know, by my actions, not my words. As a great prophet said to his prophets as he dropped them off at a town, I want you to go in and carry the good news. And if it's necessary, use words. 
but, the, but they were supposed to go demonstrate the gospel, live it out, not talk about it, not be able to articulate it, and definitely not put it in a box of certainty. So I'm going to ask the band to come back up. We're going to pray. And I just encourage you today, man, if, you, if you're stuck in the box of certainty in any aspect of your faith, I encourage you to ask God to help you divorce yourself from it and not be trapped by this idea of certainty. To live into a faith journey that's led by confidence, not by certainty, but strong confidence. The same confidence that allowed you to say I do to your spouse or get on an airplane or drive your car. That kind of confidence. So you can lead confident in that Jesus is real. Jesus died. Jesus gave his life for the world. Jesus was resurrected. And Jesus will come again. Amen. Amen. I had total confidence in all those things. But am I uncertain of all the details? No. And if you got a certain spell on it, great. You know? I might agree with you, I might not, but it doesn't matter because I'm not going to put my faith and trust in that. I'm going to put my faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus' words and what he said, and I believe that fully. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your message today. It's not an easy message. You know, bringing out our doubts in this world that we live in is, it takes courage to say, I don't know what I believe sometimes. Lord, and so that's real. And I know that you accept each and every one of us with our doubts, with our defects, with our hurts, with our habits, with our hangups, everything that we have, you accept us just as we are because of your son, Jesus. And because he's willing to pay it all for everybody. That we could all be accepted into your sight to be holy, to be saints. And we all have that invitation, Lord. And none of us do it perfectly. But Lord, we know because of the Holy Spirit, and as a body of Christ, if we come together truly and live out the kingdom life in confidence in your words to us and not get caught in the certainty and beating people over the head with it, but just inviting people, everybody that we meet and greet, Lord, as you did in your walk on earth with love and service as our code, truly honoring and worshiping and loving God and loving people just how they are. If we can do that, Lord, we know that we're living out the kingdom message. So, Lord, we just pray boldly today that any barriers that exist inside us, that block us, that put anything into the box of certainty, that, that we can remove those things and we can learn to just walk in the world by confidence and so we can be a maximum service to you and the people about us. It's in your son's name that we pray these things. Amen. Hi again, this is Harold. Thanks for listening to our weekly message and podcast. I hope that we have shared something helpful to you wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Just so you know a little bit more about us, we are Hill Tran United. Hill Tran United is an alliance between Hillsboro United Methodist Church and Transformation United Methodist Church. We are kingdom churches and kingdom communities for people who aren't into church. We meet Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. at Hillsboro United Methodist Church and 11 a.m. at Transformation United Methodist Church. Both churches are located in the northeastern tip of the beautiful Ozark Mountains, located in Jefferson County, Missouri. We also meet during the week in smaller groups that we call life groups and home churches, and that's how we make it relational. We hear regularly from people from all over who are engaging in personal and group studies based on our teaching, and we would love to know if that is happening where you are at. If you want to connect with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Vimeo, and YouTube, or you can download our app from your favorite app store. Just search for the app titled Our Church by Church Dev and enter in Hilltran United and you can access all of our available audio, video teachings, plus through the app you can, and our, or our website, you can download our PowerPoint slides, bulletin, sermon notes, and discussion questions. It's all there for you. And lastly, if you want to learn more about how you can support Hillsboro United Methodist Church or Transformation United Methodist Church financially, please go to www.hilltran.com dot org for more information and to give we appreciate anything you can do to help hey thanks for being a member of this extended church family i'm glad we are in this together as kingdom people commencing shoulder to shoulder to help people rediscover life and experience the kingdom of god